Hello and welcome to the Killick & Co podcast for Friday the 19th of August. This week saw more subdued equity markets after the record highs reached in the US last week, uh, with the US markets essentially flat over the week, while in the UK the market was down around 1% and in Europe markets were down around 2.5%. Uh, moving on to the macro picture, uh, in the UK this week we saw uh, inflation data being released and this was the first inflation data since the Brexit referendum and it basically saw all the metrics that are tracked by the ONS moving up. Uh, CPI rose to 1.6% year on year, though this is still well below the, uh, the, the 2% target by the Bank of England, however it was the, uh, some of the other metrics that got more attention from the markets. Uh, looking at RPI, that was up around 1.9%, um, and uh, some of the other metrics, such as uh, producer input prices, were up even more at around 4.3%, as, as the weakness from sterling has had an immediate impact on the cost of importing goods from abroad. Um, other economic data that was released uh, over the, the week was UK retail sales and here the surprise to the upside at around 5.4% and you can see that on this chart here, the, the, the strong bounce that we've seen and uh, there the, the ONS um, was pointing out the fact that there seems to have been very strong tourist spending uh, due to the weaker pound as potentially one of the drivers behind these strong retail sales. Uh, UK unemployment data was also uh, was also strong, and the the, the impact of all these strong um, economic uh, uh, data points was that we did see a bounce in sterling this week, uh, up from the lows that had been a, a week ago. In the US, the minutes from the most recent Federal Reserve meeting were released, uh, suggesting a divided rate setting committee but that a rate hike still remained a possibility before the end of the year. Uh, and this can be seen on uh, the, uh, the, the chart of, of the December rate hike expectations, which continue to track around a 50% probability that's implied by the markets. Uh, in, in, in Europe, the minutes from the July ECB meeting indicated that the, the bank did remain firmly in the easing mode, um, and that given the current economic backdrop and heightened uncertainty, a very accommodative monetary policy stance would remain warranted. So the bank, uh, the ECB is, is due to meet again in September where an extension of the quantitative easing program is, is seen as possible. Moving on to the thematic note that we are releasing this week, um, this is a thematic note around the, the potential we believe for an increased infrastructure spending. Um, and I'll illustrate the point by a quote that uh, Hillary Clinton has made in the US presidential elections. Um, and it's basically the fact that uh, they need to put Americans to work building and modernizing roads, tunnels, railways, ports, uh, airports, etc. And the reason for this has been the, the, the massive amount of underinvestment um, that we've seen in, in infrastructure. Uh, and that's illustrated by this chart here, um, which shows how. Um, US government gross investment um, is pretty much near the, the, the lowest level it's been since the 60s. Um, towards the end of last year was the actual the lowest level. So why do we think uh, infrastructure is, is, a, is a good theme for investing purposes? Well, as I mentioned, there's been a significant amount of underinvestment in infrastructure, not just in the US, but across um, Europe and, and the rest of the world as well, and that's been impacting productivity and economic growth. Um, there's also been a realisation that the unconventional monetary policy um, that has been seen since the financial crisis may now be running out of steam. There's also been increased populism in, in, in politics, uh, which sees fiscal stimulus as, as more helping lower income levels, um, as opposed to QE, which was more seen as, as just helping the rich. And also the government changes that we're seeing um, with presidential elections in the, the US and the, the changes in the UK government post-Brexit um, means that these sort of changes to fiscal austerity look more likely. What stocks do we believe play to this theme? So th we've got four stocks that uh, we have under coverage with buyers and that we believe are, are good ways of, of playing this potential theme. So Heidelberg Cement, that's one of the world's largest cement and, and aggregates companies. 
um, with, with strong position in, in both the, the US and, and Europe. Um, Ashstead, which is a leading supplier of, of rental tools and equipment, both in the US and in uh, the UK. Hill & Smith, it's a, a leading supplier of roadside equipment as, as well as galvanising services, both of which go into infrastructure spending in the UK and US. And then finally, Taylor Wimpy, a, a UK house builder uh, with good national coverage and a strong management team. Um, and there have been comments out of um, the, the, the new UK government about the need to stimulate house building in the UK. Uh, in terms of, of stocks that reported last week, um, it was a pretty quiet week, but uh, one, of our, one of our buy stocks reported, and that, that was Home Depot, uh, was, was, were good numbers. They were in line on, on both in revenue and earnings. Uh, however, they upgraded guidance for the rem remainder of the year. Uh, and the one metric that we look quite closely at for them is, is their, the rate of same store sales. In other words, um, the growth that they're seeing from stores that have already been open for an extended period of time rather than just opening new stores. And, and there they continue to track um, above their closest peer lows um, after last quarter where lows actually saw stronger same store sales growth than them. They've now bounced back. Um, so we continue to like Home Depot. Uh, in terms of the week ahead, as I said, it's, it's the earnings season is pretty much at an end now, so it's a pretty quiet week. However, uh, the, one, the one important stock for us that's reporting on Thursday is Medtronic. Um, so Medtronic is one of the world's largest uh, medical device company. It plays to the theme of, of aging populations, and it's also a big beneficiary of a shift to outcome outcome based healthcare. And what that means is, is where healthcare is much more focused on curing a patient at the lowest possible cost. So a, a case study for, for what Medtronic does, uh, we use diabetes. So they, diabetes is, is a very important disease. Um, one in eight dollars of, of healthcare spend is involved in treating diabetes. 50% of, of people with diabetes are not in control of their disease. Uh, an improved monitoring of blood sugar levels would lead to far fewer hospitalizations on the back of diabetes. And, and in the US, that's, that's believed to cost around two and a half billion a year. So Medtronic has been working with IBM uh, to develop smarter um, sensors and devices uh, that predict sugar lows and, and suspend the insulin delivery. Um, and the ultimate target for Medtronic on their, on their diabetes roadmap um, is an artificial pancreas. So we, we believe the medical companies offer, uh, medical device companies offer a, a better uh, a better investment opportunity than many of the pharmaceutical companies as, as they're more focused on long-term cures and long-term treatment that reduce the need for, for expensive drugs. That's all from us this week. Uh, thanks very much for watching.